Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the MAA Project Next Lecture on Teaching and Learning. My name is David Kong. I am honored to serve as the director of MAA Project Next. Um, it's, uh, you know, this is a talk that we've been, uh, a session that we've been uh, hosting since 2014. We've had an amazing list of, of people giving this session, um, and we want to add uh, uh, Dr. Estrella Johnson to that list today. Um, Project Next, if you don't know, is a professional development program for young math, um, for new math faculty, and we, we usually use the term newish math faculty. Um, and so if you, uh, if you don't know anything about MAA Project Next, uh, please stop by the MEA Pavilion down in the exhibit hall and learn something about, about the program. Just, or you could just turn to some people. Raise your hand if you're a Nexter in the room. We have lots of great Nexters. So you can talk to one of them. Um, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Estrella Johnson. If you wanted a long list of accomplishments, which is long, um, you could look that up yourself. You all have a phone. Um, I wanted to say some, uh, some things about why I'm really excited that she's here. Uh, one is that she really has a, a, a dedication to diversity and equity and inclusion um, in the mathematical sciences, but in academia more broadly. Um, and and that's, uh, that's a passion that she now brings to her job at Virginia Tech as Associate Dean for Inclusion and, and Diversity. Um, as part of that role, she's launched a, a very successful uh, program to help support minoritized students, uh, especially freshman students, called a Diversifying Science Peer Mentoring Program. Um, they also now at Virginia Tech have a comprehensive faculty and postdoc diversity hiring plan. Um, some really great work she's doing at Virginia Tech. Um, more to the mathematics side of things and the mathematics education side, one thing I really appreciate and really respect about, uh, about Strea's work is her intellectual honesty. Um, you know, some of her data earlier in her career came up that um, you know, some of the interactive engaged teaching, which other folks had shown, closes achievement gaps, especially in terms of gender. Um, some of her data like, went the other way. And she was really honest and open about that, and, and I really appreciate that, because I think some people might have just run from that or hid that. Um, I also think that um, you know, one of the other things that I love about her work is that it's really not just theoretical. She really wants to know not just how do students learn, how can we, but how can we like, improve that in sort of a lab set setting, or like when, when one of those of us who study the work you know, implement that in the classroom. She really wants to know what does that look like when mathematicians implement that in the classroom, and how can we make sure that any materials we provide support them in supporting students and their learning. So with that, please help me welcome Dr. Estrella Johnson. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, there it is, good. Um, yeah, thank you, and thank you, Project Next. Thank you, Dave, for inviting me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so here's my talk, what the research says about active learning and what it doesn't. Um, so yeah, there'll be some caveats here. The, the, the research in active learning does tell us that this is the way we want to go, but it's not conclusive, and it's not the dichotomy that it's always made out to be. So those are some issues that we'll touch on during this talk. So I'll start just with some motivation. Why are we talking about active learning? Um, and, and we have lots of data, right? So this comes from uh, Freeman's work that was recently, well, in 2014 published in the Proceedings of the National Academies. Um, where less than 40% of U.S. students who enter university with an interest in STEM actually complete that degree. That number is even worse for underrepresented minority students. And this is something that we've known for a while. So in 1997, uh, Seymour published her work talking about leaving. And at that point, 40% of undergraduate students were leaving. Um, and then when they redid the study in 2019, it was still 40 to 50% of students were leaving, right? So this is a well-known phenomenon. It's been studying a lot. We know students are leaving. Um, so in math in particular, I just pulled some of the pass rates that we had. Um, so this comes from a 2015 census survey where we sent a survey to all math departments that offered a grad degree. And we asked, what's your DFW rate for pre-calc calc 1 and calc 2? Right? So these numbers happen. Um, a lot of times when we talk about students leaving STEM, it starts in pre-calc and calc, right? 
So when we talk to students, when Seymour and Hunter talk to students, like again and again what they point to are these introductory classes. That there's content overload, incoherent presentation, material pitched too high or inappropriate. Um, so it's a problem with teaching is what the students are pointing to. Um, and I think sometimes in math we can get a bit defensive and it's a problem about student preparation, it's a changing landscape in higher ed, but these are the students that we're teaching. Right, and they're saying that we're not engaging them, we're not teaching them, right? So this is a problem with uh, curriculum design, overload, pace, and lecture is often what they point to. So in, oh, when did this come out? Common Vision it was the five big professional societies in mathematics came out with a common vision document and they said the status quo is unacceptable. We need to move away from traditional lecture. Right, we have to more actively engage students than we have in the past. Um, but what do we know about active learning? Right, so there's all these calls, there's kind of traditional lecture isn't reaching students, we're turning them away, there's content overload, we need to be more active. Do we know that's gonna work? I think is a reasonable question to ask. So Freeman et al. in their big meta-analysis in 2014 looked at studies across STEM to see, yeah, does active learning work? If we look across all of these studies, what does it tell us? What's the consensus here in this data? So they looked at 225 studies that reported exam scores and failure rates across STEM, um, usually comparing some sort of active learning intervention to a traditional class. And what they found was that examination scores improved by 6% in the active learning, and students were one and a half times more likely to fail if they're in a traditional lecture class than they were in an active learning class. So this is the graphs that they presented on that. So the orange up there is lecture, and we see you know, more than 30% failure rate. When we look at all the studies for active learning, that failure rate comes down to about 20%. We get the distribution. Uh, the graph on the left um, is the number of studies that kind of report what, what percentage change. So it's pretty conclusive. If I look at these studies as a whole, I see that students are failing less in active learning classes, right? And that's their main takeaway from that study. So I wanted to kind of pull apart some of those papers so we can see what it looks like. That was all aggregate, so if we look at individual papers, what did they tell us? So I went through and I looked for math papers that were published in this century in journals that I recognized, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna present three of those for you all. So this one happened in uh, Interactive Learning Centered, Centered Methods of Teaching Mathematics course, right? So a course for pre-service teachers. Um, the diamonds are what was happening in kind of the traditional setting. This teacher changed how they taught, and now we get the stripes. Okay? So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna refer to this as like everyone gets an A class, right? They did something different in the class. We see a huge change in their distribution. Much more students are getting A's, we see much less CDs and F's. Okay, so this is an example of that data of I did something different and the outcomes changed. This one is a whole calc sequence. So we have calc one, calc two, and calc three, and we see that the pass rates were below 70. After their intervention, they're over 80. Right? So again, we get more students are passing um, throughout the implementations. Oh, sorry. This one was on a college algebra, so something below calc. Um, and you see with the traditional approach, they were failing half their students. Under their intervention, they got down to 28% DFW, which is much more in line with the national average that we know happens in, in pre-calc. Right? So this is just a sample of how these studies look like and collecting all of this data, we get this pretty strong statement then in active learning classes on the whole, failure rates decrease, grades increase, right? Um, so yeah, overall the preponderance of evidence points to active learning being beneficial for student outcomes. But what's active learning? Right, like this is a question. We have these interventions, we have these studies. Uh, so let's look at how it was defined by Freeman. Um, yeah, so it varied widely in intensity. It included diverse approaches, um, occasional problem solving worksheets. It could just be doing worksheets in class. Um, personal response systems, so clickers. 
uh, with or without peer instruction, studio workshop course design. So that's a lot of things that we could be doing in there, right? Um, so let's look at the math classes again. So I'm gonna go back to those studies multiple times. So let's see what active le learning looked like in those three studies I presented earlier. So back to the everyone gets an A class. What they did was learning-centered activities, interactive presentations, student presentations, and interactive take-home exams. Okay, so certainly that falls under what we would call active learning. For the calc sequence, we get collaborative learning sessions in small groups, worksheets. Okay. For the half failing and now uh, normal, we get working on modeling problems, whole or partial in-class discussions. Okay, so we get a lot of group work, we got a lot of whole class discussion, we get some workshop worksheets. These are the examples of the titles from the other STEM studies, where I just, I just pulled the titles, I didn't even go to the abstracts. What sorts of things did they list? Um, so Dave told me I had to do active learning in this presentation, so this is your first chance. I want you to talk to a neighbor. What do you see? What are some themes, what are some categories that you see? So go in and talk to a buddy. If you're in the back, there's seats up front, come on in. Okay, I'm gonna pause you here, because if you do too much active learning, I'm not gonna be able to cover my slides. <laughs> All right, it's a <laughs> perennial problem. Um, so some things that I noticed when I looked at this, there was lots of vague terms, like active learning, um, cooperative learning, uh, student active learning pedagogies, right? So I don't get a lot of information. If I read the paper, I'd probably get more information. Um, some things that are kind of trademarked, I would say, in STEM education, uh, like peer instruction, means something to physics ed researchers, right? So some of this might give me more information. Some of it, and this was before COVID, is about instructional format and like using computers in ways that we hadn't before. Um, so hybrid lecture online classes, online homework systems, right? So incorporating technology in some sort of way. Some of it is clickers. Some of it's aggressive questioning. I don't know about hot seat questioning, <laughs> unannounced quizzes, right? Um, but ways to get students' voices in class in different ways. Um, some of it is writing. Uh, one person cloned the professor, which is a fantastic technology that we need to spread across STEM ed. Um, so there's lots of ways, and I think when we look at this together, we kind of get this interpretation that doing literally anything is better than lecture, right? And if we just continue to lecture, we're actually harming students. And this was an interpretation that really got picked up after uh, this Freeman meta-analysis came out. Here's some quotes, there was lots of fun quotes that came out. Um, so this is Eric Mazur, a, a famous physicist. Um, so what's he say? It's almost unethical to be lecturing if you have this data set, right? Some people have called lecturing uh, the equivalent of malpractice. I don't think anyone put that in writing because they don't want to get sued. I, I looked for the malpractice quote and I couldn't get it, um, but unethical, we get this one from the, the lead author, if you're going to get lectured at, you might as well be at home in bunny slippers, right? So people had a strong reaction to the, this, this meta-analysis. Um, and this was from the original paper. It raises questions about the continued use of traditional lecture as control in research. So he's not even saying that we should be like 
doing it in our normal teaching, we shouldn't even be doing it as a research control because we're hurting those students who are assigned to the control group. Right? So some really strong statements were made um, based on this work. Um, but like, I'm a little bit, okay. Let me go back, can I find it? Yeah, the use of traditional lecture. If everything is active learning, then what's traditional lecture? Right, it almost feels like we got a straw man argument here. So, so this was a question that I had, is like how many people are doing traditional lecture? Where they're not even doing a worksheet, they're not even like doing occasional group work, they're not doing like a think pair share, they're doing nothing, right? So I wanted to find out. So we did a survey. So in 2019, I was on a project that did a survey looking at the use of research-based instructional strategies. So overall, the team looked at instructors of first year chemistry, physics, and math. So I'll report here on the uh, 1,349 instructors of Calc 1 or Calc 2. Um, and I just asked them, like, do you do any of these? Right, so we got small group work, think, pair, share, IBL, some things that we've heard about. Um, Pogo is coming from chemistry ed, but there is kind of a curriculum developed for calc. Um, so again, active learning break. Quickly turn to a neighbor, do you have a guess about what the percentage are? How many Calc 1 instructors, what percentage, do you think do a small group work or a think pair share? I really wish I had clickers right now. I would totally make you click in. Are you ready? Okay. So half of Calc 1 or 2 instructors say they do some small group work. Some think pair share. IBL came up as kind of the biggest kind of instructional innovation named project out there. 10% um, of you guys are doing concept maps. Um, so we sent out the same list to mathematicians, physicists, and chemists. So some of these I wasn't expecting to show up in, in calculus, and it did anyway. And across the board, 73% of the people in the survey said that they're currently doing at least one of these, right? So 73% of these surveys are included in what Freeman's talking about, but we're also still failing a lot of people in calc. So it kind of creates this, this tension there. Um, in addition, only 6% of our respondents said that they lecture for more than 90% of the time. And half of them say that they lecture for half the time, so you can, you know, half do more, half do less. So it's not this kind of situation where everyone's doing traditional lecture, and if we just did anything else, we're gonna magically fix this, right? So I think the problem I have with this interpretation is that it ignores the fact that these are research studies. Right? So it's not that they're going out and just popping into people's classes or randomly assigning small group work. Right? These people did a research study and then, and then published that research study, and I think that gets missed in a lot of these interpretations. So I have an alternate interpretation, that thoughtful educators who are systematically trying to improve their teaching, in this case, by increasing student engagement during class time, are generally successful. Right? So instead of the goal being, let's do more active learning, I think the goal can be, oh, how do we think about engaging people as thoughtful educators, right? So going back to those three math studies I talked about before, um, so that everyone gets A's class, this teacher, when I read the paper, he had taught this class 15 times previously, and then completely reorganized the class. So now students met with a professor one-on-one -on -one to plan kind of a presentation of new course materials. The students also were required to present that work at an MAA section meeting, and then they had a take-home exam with an in-person interview component, right? And then the teacher taught this class another seven times this way, collected data and evaluated the results, and then went through all of the process to get that peer-reviewed and published, right? So it's not just that this person did active learning one day, it's that they systematically redesigned their course and evaluated the effects of that. Um, this one with the calc, this was a whole overhaul of their calc sequence, right? So there is diagnostic testing. They invent or created a new calc infused, infused with pre-calc course, a year-long course. Uh, there's collaborative learning, but there is also increased coordination on exams 
and an early warning system. So if students were doing poorly, there was interventions that they could do ahead of time. Right? So again, it wasn't just, I did active learning one day. Complete redesign. The same with the modeling-based college algebra course. Um, the instructors were meeting weekly to co-plan. Right? They restructured all of their content and assessments. They added group work, certainly, but there is also this, this dedicated push to do more than just what we would call active learning around this class. Right? So this is the interpretation that, that I want to kind of make the argument for. And then this is our goal. Like, how do we get more thoughtful educators system systematically trying to improve their teaching? Right? So I have some research that speaks towards this goal, so I'm gonna talk about what we know currently about instructors' attitudes and beliefs towards teaching and active learning, um, what we know about local supports, and then the kind of departmental environments that support active learning kind of at the broad level that we see in those calculus classes um, from those studies and that pre-cal class. Okay, so what do we know about what instructors uh, believe and their attitudes towards teaching? I ask them, I ask them a lot of things. Um, so this came from a study back in 2010, so it is a bit old, um, but we, we did a survey of Calc 1 instructors, so this is 700 Calc 1 instructors, and we asked them, how interested are you in these things? How interested in you are participating in activities about how students learn key ideas, and how interested in you are you in improving your teaching? So again, turn to a neighbor, take a guess, under, over, more or less, So there's this narrative around mathematicians and math instructors that they don't really care about teaching, they just want to do their research, they want to be left alone with their math, but a lot of them want to improve their teaching. 65% are interested in improving their teaching because it feels bad to teach poorly. Like every day you walk into the classroom, that feels bad, right? Like people want to improve. People are interested in how their students learn ideas, you know, at least moderately. Um, so here's another one. This one was asked to abstract algebra instructors. So a different uh, set of course constraints, um, likely a different set of like tenure uh, security with this one. So we asked them, I think lecture is the best way to teach. We asked them a lot of things. I'm gonna highlight these three. I think students learn better when they do mathematical work in class. Um, and I think students learn better when they struggle with ideas prior to me explaining the mathematical material. Okay. So on the top, of agree and disagree, and then I have it broken down by what kind of institution they are at. So a bachelor's granting, a master's granting, a PhD granting, and then a collapsed for all of them. Turn to your neighbor. It's gonna be so active all day. So yes, a lot of people do think lecture is the best way to teach. A lot of people want their students to do mathematical work during class. A lot of people, 87%. A 
A lot of people think students should struggle, struggle with material before they come to class. And that might be that they want them to read the textbook before they show up to class, right? But they still want them to actively think about it. So it's not this giant push to get mathematicians to agree that students need to actively think, right? We know this. Um, and how do we reconcile that with lecture, right? So it kind of shifts the question that we're asking. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like this. I like that 87% of people want their students to be doing something in class, in addition to taking notes. We wrote that in there, so that way someone wouldn't be like, well, taking notes is doing math, right? We wanted to do something additional. Okay, so we have these kind of positive beliefs out there. What's going on kind of in, on the ground? Why, why do people teach the way they do? A lot of times we talk about the context that they're in. So we also ask them about the context that they're in, right? So this was a fun question. Um, I gave the survey, this is again to the uh, abstract algebra teachers. So they had to kind of identify like, do you identify as someone who lectures or as someone who does active learning? So for the people who kind of self-identified as people who, who predominantly lecture or lecturers, we asked, would you consider teaching in a different way? So the people who said, yes, I would consider that, we, we gave them this prompt. I have not attempted other types of pedagogy because, and then they got to select a reason. If they're like, no, I'm gonna lecture forever, I would not consider something else, we gave them this prompt, I will never switch from lecture because. Right? So all of the reasons up here came from, from literature, from research that had talked to mathematicians about why they teach the way they do. Do you guys have a guess about what's gonna be the most popular response? Other. Other. <laughs> it wasn't, we captured their ideas pretty good. So I haven't had time, yes, we are all busy, I understand that. Um, a lot of the other ones, for the people who would consider it, but like just haven't yet, I think it was about support, it was about professional development. Right, I don't have the support, I don't know where to start, I haven't found materials that I like. For the people who are staunch lecturers who don't wanna change, I need to cover a certain amount of material. Right, we hear this again and again. If I have to cover this material, I have to do it during lecture. Um, but there's also like, I think it would go poorly. It's scary to do something different, right? We gotta honor that. Um, it's not appropriate for my students. Um, this is abstract algebra, right? So it's not that they're working with weaker students, students that aren't prepared. These are advanced students and they still think that it's not appropriate for them. So this got us thinking. Um, I have people that don't lecture are they just not worried about coverage? Are they at institutions where coverage isn't such a big deal? Do they have more supports? Like is there something that I can identify that maybe is predictive of how much people spend lecture? So we sent this. So for this survey or this cut of the data, we categorized people into limited lecturers, so people who lectured less than 25% of the time, moderate between 25 and 75, and then extensive lecturers who lectured over 75% of the time, and we just ask them, like, do you have pressure from your department to cover a fixed set of material? Because maybe the people that are doing less lecture feel less pressure. And the people who are lecturing a lot have so much external pressure, right? So we kind of tested these hypotheses this way. Um, so the first one is about coverage. The second one is about freedom to make changes, right? If I'm locked into a coordinated thing, it would make sense that I, I think I can't change. Um, whether or not a redesign of my course would be valued for PNT, right? If I'm devoting time to this, like is that gonna be valued or should I just keep doing research? And then the last one is whether or not I have travel support for professional development. So talk to a neighbor, which of these do you think will be different depending on how much time was spent lecturing by these instructors?
Do we have guesses? Do we think that there's going to be big differences anywhere? Tenure. Tenure? Number three with the PNT? Support. Support? Number one, all of them, maybe all of them should be different, is what we would expect. None of them were different. <laughs> no matter how much time I spent lecturing, 70% of people didn't have any external pressure from the department about coverage. Um, everyone thought that they had the freedom to make changes. The PNT was all yeses and maybes. Right? Um, and whether or not I have support to go to professional development was all yeses and maybes. That's like the one place where we have like that random seven. That was the only change we saw on this table. So there's not like some magic thing that I can do from the outside, like, oh, if I just like remove pressure, all of a sudden people are gonna stop lecturing. People aren't really feeling pressure from their department. Um, it might be a disciplinary pressure about what needs to be in an abstract algebra course. It might be a personal pressure, like I need to get to Galois theory or whatever, right? But it's not coming from the outside, which means it's something that they can change. And the people who are lecturing less just got over it somehow, is my best guess here, right? Either by doing it, they figured out that they could in fact cut things and it wasn't the end of the world, or they decided they didn't have to say everything out loud and students could learn at home. Like, right, they found a way to get over the pressure that they weren't feeling anyway. Um, so taking this together, it's like, okay, we have some positive beliefs. There's not a lot of like, if only my school did this one thing, something that would change. So we started thinking about the departmental environments that people were in. Like, what's the culture? What's the climate? What are people doing there? Um, so this data is going to go back to the most recent um, survey that we did of teachers of first year chemistry, math, and physics. So the way that we designed that survey is we tried to get multiple respondents from the same department. So that later we can go back and be like, okay, at this department, I have more than one respondent who is doing more active learning, who's doing less lecturing. So can I figure out what's going on in that department, right? So in total, we identified 18 departments across the three disciplines where their response, like the amount of time they spent lecturing was lower than the national average for two or more instructors, right? And then we did interviews with those. Um, instructors to figure out if we can identify what was going on in those departments. That led them to kind of this, this culture or this department of active learning. Um, and you're about to see a, a, a very, um, I don't know, model -y version of that. Um, so what we found in talking to the, these people that it starts, it starts with motivated people. Motivated people who are knowledgeable about active learning and then leverage opportunities can develop and enhance a, a culture and structures that support active learning. Once they get that going, they get more motivated people involved, right? So we get this little feedback, and that first chunk leads to high use of active learning. Um, in this study, we're only looking at intro classes, so we don't, we kept it for intro classes. Um, and then once they get more use of active learning, that reinforces this culture, where this is positive and, and we do this, and that brings more motivated people along, right? So I'll go through the kind of different parts of this model of who are the motivated people. Sometimes they're educational researchers. Sometimes they're just faculty who care about teaching, right? That's great. Department chairs um, and institutional leaders could also be the motivated people here. Knowledgeable active learning, I have a list here from just math of places where we can go and get more information about how to do active learning in math. Um, there's lots of them out there. And then what are the kind of opportunities that they're leveraging? Sometimes it's funding. You know, they need active learning classrooms. They need uh, classrooms to be retrofitted so that desks can move. Sometimes it's institutional pressures. Um, so a dean or another college gets upset about graduation rates or DFWs. Sometimes it's strategic hiring. So is there initiative around um, bringing somebody in to take over calculus coordination? Right. So in terms of what the cultures and structures look like, there's a lot here. So some of these things are institutional level. So I'm at a place that values undergrad teaching. Um, my evaluation of teaching for my annual faculty evaluation cares about what I'm doing beyond spot scores. They, right, there's observations. I have to write a statement about what I did differently this year. Uh, really active teaching and learning centers, which I think is not something we often think about in math, but there's certainly professionals there who can help us. 
And then if there were other deeper researchers, so does disciplinary-based educational research? It doesn't have to be in your department, but is there somebody there talking about science ed? Um, at the department level, I'm not gonna read all these out loud, lots of things. Um, common curriculum, active learning classroom, so again, spaces that you can use. A culture of continued innovation. This is something that we saw again and again at these places, that classes didn't sit. Like people talked about it in the hall, they redesigned, they worked together and there is a culture that I was gonna work on these classes. Um, yeah, so, so looking at individuals doesn't usually do it. Looking at one-off supports doesn't usually do it. But if I can think about this as a system, as an environment, then we start to get some traction on how we can do more active learning in our classes. Um, but I do have some additional considerations that I want you to think about with active learning. Um, so I, there's lots of things we do in a classroom, right? So yes, we could prioritize active student engagement. Sometimes we have pressure uh, from within, from external, real or imagined, about content requirements. There's also a feasibility about what an individual instructor can take on at any given time. Um, that's very real, we all know that. And then there's also this drive and this want to make more inclusive environments and equitable outcomes for our students. And it's not always gonna be the case that one thing is gonna meet all of these goals, right? And I think that's part of this like dichotomy between lecture and active learning is that like anything good we're gonna call active learning and we're gonna assume that it's good for everything in the same way. So there's a couple of things that I wanna say. One is bad active learning is still bad, right? It's not just like a magic thing that's always great. Uh, so again, talk to a neighbor have you ever been in a bad active learning class where like maybe it would have been better if they just gave you a solid lecture? So try to describe that to your neighbor. What made it bad? Okay, I'm gonna cut you off there. So back in, this was again the survey from 2010. We, we gave a survey to 14,000 Calc 1 students. And part of what we asked them was like, tell us about your class. So we had all of these dimensions that they could tell us about the instruction from their teacher. And we also asked them how confident were they in their mathematical ability um, at the beginning of the semester and at the end. So this will only report at the end. Um, and in looking at how they talked about the class and, and how they rated it, um, the researchers, uh, the, the quantitative researchers came up with two factors, a progressive teaching factor and a good teaching factor. And those factors aren't the same. So the things that showed up in progressive teaching were active learning, right? Had students give presentations, held class discussions. The things that showed up in the good teaching were my instructor listened carefully to my questions allowed time for me to understand difficult ideas, right? So when I remove this white box, there's gonna be four dots. And it's the confidence of somebody who reported low progressive teaching and high good teaching, for instance. Everyone kind of imagine what that's gonna look like? If I'm doing high progressive teaching, but low good teaching, students' confidence levels are shot in that class. Right? Where like if I'm just doing a solid good teaching, like my students are doing pretty good, right? Like certainly the best quadrant or however you wanna talk about it is high good teaching, high progressive teaching, but it still has to be high good teaching, right? I can't throw good teaching out the window for the sake of active learning, right? So the other one I wanna talk about is differential outcomes and, and Dave kind of alluded to this. Um, I had this grant uh, teaching inquiry-oriented mathematics establishing supports, and it was a professional development grant. 
where we had curriculum developed for three inquiry-oriented courses. Um, so we had the curricular materials, we did a summer workshop, and then we met with these mathematicians um, once a week during their implementation of these materials. So it was high touch um, professional development, it was a long term, we were really working with them to implement an inquiry oriented curriculum. Um, and luckily I was leading abstract algebra and I had a content assessment. So I worked with 13 abstract algebra fellows and I got this content assessment data from 84% of their students. And then I also kind of had a natural built-in control group um, from Kate Meluish, who developed the assessment. So she had data from 375 abstract algebra students not involved in our study, most likely in a lecture class. Something like 87% of abstract algebra instructors predominantly lecture. So I have this little table that I'll uncover. Um, so we have the not time students, so probably lecture. And then we have the time students who you can think of as an active learning group. And then blue will be women's scores and green will be men's scores. And the research literature would have suggested that like in the lecture, their scores were gonna be low and I was gonna improve them. And it would have also suggested that maybe there was a gender gap in the lecture classes and I was gonna close that in my active learning class. But this is what happened instead. Uh, so I checked many, many times to make sure I didn't get the data wrong. Um, <laughs> The quartiles were exactly the same for men and women in lecture. And what I did in my intervention was actually support men and leave women flat. I even pulled down their, their, their median there, right? Um, and when we ran the stats on it, it was significant, right? So the, the men scored two items out of 15 better than the women in my active learning class. But we didn't really change the overall you know, score if I, if I didn't disaggregate by, data, by gender. So if we think about some of these studies that are saying active learning is better, if I don't disaggregate the data and it's in a male heavy class, it could just be that I'm helping the men and I didn't look at that data, right? So kind of the point there being is like active learning can make some things worse unintentionally, right? So we can't just assume everything's gonna be better and it's gonna work better for everyone all the time. So. Again, this is an interpretation that we've all kind of taken away from the Freeman paper and that's kind of floating around a lot, that lecture is bad and it's harmful to keep doing it. I don't like that one. I do like this one, right? Thoughtful educators who are systematically trying to improve their teaching. And that could be by increasing student engagement. That could be by making a more inclusive and equitable space. That could be by doing more data analytics, right? But if they're engaged and actively improving their teaching, I do believe that they're gonna be successful. And luckily, like 65% of instructors want to do that. So we have an idea about how to do that, and all of you in this room can be a motivated people. You can take this back to your departments, um, and here's a list of supports to do that. What? Oh. <laughs> so Dave rushed me, and now he said we have lots of time for questions. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry, You're fine. Thank you very much um, uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I really appreciate the the uh, you know the perspective on the research and what the research actually says. Um, in in the spirit of this talk, we have some time for questions. If you could turn to your neighbor and come up with some good questions for her, there is a mic in the middle. So turn to your neighbor and, and what question would you like to to answer to to ask Dr. Johnson here? Um, and we can make a line down the middle. We'll give you a couple of minutes here to to come up with good questions. I, I meant to end at this time anyway.
All right, thanks very much. We have, a, we have five people lined up here. I, this sounded a little harsh, but I saw this great line on Twitter that um, uh, for a Q&A, somebody was just frustrated that people would get the mic and then, and then like, get on their soapbox. And, and the line was, uh, you know, please make sure your, your, you know, your question, the, the, the first sentence is in the form of a question, and there isn't a second. <laughs> but, um, but go ahead, please, please, your question. So how did you address the gender gap, and are there resources specifically tailored to thinking about and addressing these types of things? I so far know that there's a problem. Um, so the way that we had done the study is we collected classroom data, but we never talked to students because we were convinced that active learning was better for everyone in exactly the same way. So we got this result that it wasn't actually equitable, and we've tried to do a lot of kind of post hoc analysis to see if we can find some pointers. And, and I think there are some things that are coming out in the data. Um, these classes were very interactive. There's lots of discussion, and we're seeing differences in the questions that were asked to women as opposed to men. Um, so easier questions that didn't get followed up on in the class the same way. I think there's also, like, once you open up more interactions, there's more chance of negative interactions. Um, so in some of our small groups, we saw instances of, um, so like, maybe four group members, and one man turned to the two women in the group and said, we'll do the math, you make sure the poster looks pretty. Right, like, there's opportunities for this, um, that, yeah, putting students in groups isn't magically gonna erase all of societal ills and biases. Um, so I want to study that more, and so far we kind of have some, some pointers to that. Um, and we have two papers out, if you want to read more about that, you could just Google Scholar my name, and you can see kind of the preliminary findings on that. But we don't have all the answers yet, we just know it's a problem. Thanks, go ahead. Sorry, Dave, it's a couple of sentences. <laughs> uh, you, had, you talked about good interpretations and finding the right interpretation. You had that slide about student confidence with the red line and blue line. Yeah. The interpretation I feel like putting on that is that investing in good teaching makes a bigger difference than investing in active learning. Is that a good interpretation or a bad interpretation? Um, I think that good teaching really matters for students' confidence and how they feel about the class. Um, and I think confidence is something that we don't talk a lot about, but also something that came out of that study, um, and this was work by Jess Ellis Hagman, was that if I look at students who had intended to take Calc 2, um, and I controlled by grades, women still switched out one and a half times more likely. So I have a man and a woman in Calc 1, they entered the semester intending to take Calc 2. By the end of that semester, even if they both got an A, even if they both got a B, the woman was one and a half times more likely to leave STEM. And I think it's about confidence. I think it's about how that class feels. So good teaching is one way to, to kind of control for that. I think there are ways to do good teaching and active learning, obviously. Um, but I think it's just important that we don't sacrifice one for the other. Thanks very much. Uh, hi. Uh, so my question is about, I, I, we, I do understand that the active learning is very beneficial, especially in small classes. Yeah. However, I have about 100 and some students. Yep. And trying to engage students quickly leads to chaos. <laughs> How do I control that? Or is there... Any suggestion from you? Have, have you Thank tried you. cloning the professor? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think, some of my uh, clones are sitting there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think some of the research does speak to clickers, to turning to your neighbor. There's ways to more actively engage students that doesn't have to be group work, that doesn't have to be whole class discussion. Um, just giving you all a chance to talk to each other, did that keep you more engaged than if I talked here for 45 minutes? Right? You're a large group. I wasn't going to give you a worksheet. But like, there's little things that we can do to try and keep our students paying attention and interested. And I think there, there's things we can do regardless of class size. There's also ways that we can make a space feel more equitable regardless of class size, right? So we can't, I can't just be like, oh yeah, if I had 20 students and if I had movable tables, then I can do something. What can you do in the space that you have, right? So it gets back to what are the supports out there? Who's helping you improve your teaching? And that, that answer might be different for your context and your situation and your goals. So I think there are things that you can do in a very large class, like turn to a neighbor, get an idea about this before I give you the answer. Thanks. Uh, were there any things different in uh, physics and chemistry, and is there something we can learn from them? Yeah, so um, I think 
physics had the lowest amounts of lecture. Um, so one thing that Project Next has been wonderful about is getting together a group of first year kind of faculty members to talk about these issues early. The discipline of physics is smaller. There's less of them and their new faculty orientation hits a much higher percentage of first year teachers. So I think that they're able to plant these seeds and start having these discussions earlier, propagating these ideas. Um, so I think one thing we could do is, is grow Project Next. <laughs> but right, getting more supports. Um, chemistry was also a little higher than math. Um, and if you think about those classes, it, it's hard to tease apart labs, right? Where do labs happen? How active are those? Are they integrated or not? Um, and then how large are the classes? So is it large versus small? And I think math was more likely to have smaller classes, but also more likely to do more lecturing. So again, those two are not immediately tied to each other. Thanks, Drea. Hi, um, I was wondering about, you have this. Can you bring the, can you bring the mic down a little? Oh, I can. <laughs> Much shorter than my, is that better? That's yep. great. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so you had, I think, three slides where you had data on these abstract algebra teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think for the first one, you differentiated between like bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Yep. And I was wondering if you saw effects um, for those differences in the other two situations, like with the less lecture, more lecture, et cetera. Right, so we ran the survey two times. The first time we ran it just to schools that offered a graduate degree. And then I think BK was like, what about everyone else? So we re-ran the survey to include bachelor's granting institutions. Um, and yes, bachelor's granting institutions did have less lecture. Um, but I don't know about the constraint so much, right? So we think about R1s as like, okay, they're balancing service and research and teaching. At the smaller schools, they're balancing a lot more teaching, right? So it is probably a smaller classroom, but there's still a lot of constraints in their time. Um, but I do have a pair of papers that you can Google and read more about those differences. Um, but I do think that there was less lecture at the smaller schools. Thanks, go ahead. Uh, the gender disaggregated data that you showed us was very striking. Um, I was wondering a little bit about theories as to why there's that gap. You mentioned negative interactions. I was wondering if you could talk a bit to what sort of classes those negative interactions have and other theories you have for why that gap is so bad? Yeah, I do have so, so, so many guesses. Um, so one thing, so this um, gap did happen both in abstract algebra and in differential equations. Um, we don't have the data in linear algebra to do this exact analysis with, with our study. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is that I showed up in junior, senior year of a math major and I changed what it looked like to be successful in that classroom, right? So if I think about how students had been kind of programmed to do math from a very young age, it was a lot of compliance. And that's also aligns with how we gender young women to be compliant to girls, right? So if I think about these, these women who have been very successful in math for what, 16 years, and then all of a sudden I change the rules about what it means to be successful in a way where now they have to jockey for attention, they have to jockey for time, they need to be quick, they need to be assertive, they need to be aggressive, they need to behave in ways that we are more likely to encourage boys and men to behave. So I think that there might be a bit of a mismatch between their expectations from where they were coming from and their expectations in this setting. And when we saw, we did have some teachers where their gap was non-existent. And what we saw in their data was like aggressive norm setting. Like if a woman got interrupted, that person was told to stop talking, the attention went back to that woman, right? There was roles in groups so that one group member couldn't take over the whole conversation, right? So there was a lot more managing that had to be done to make that an equitable space. And we weren't attending to that at all in our study. We were attending to how the math unfolded and how the teacher was kind of progressing and following the math. And we had been ignoring kind of all of the, the social interactions that of course were present in the classroom, we just hadn't attended to. So I think if you do active learning, there's a lot of work that you have to do to think about how are you gonna make that equitable? How are you gonna make that fair? How are you gonna give everyone time and space to, to get those learning outcomes that you want? Thanks very much, and one last question. So I noticed you were doing a lot of studies on abstract algebra, and I was wondering how much that sort of result generalizes to other sorts of math classes, with maybe completely different demographics of students, completely different sizes, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, so we picked abstract algebra trying to get away from some of the constraints that teachers talk about often. Um, so it's a small class with students who are academically prepared, academically prepared. Um, there's usually only a handful of sections, so you don't have a lot of coordination issues to think about. Um, you're usually not too worried about the follow-up class and whether or not I'm preparing them like I would in Calc 1. So we thought it was a nice setting where we could take away some of the contextual constraints that teachers usually feel. It was also a place where, I don't know, for the last 20 years, math ed researchers had been doing quite a bit of research in curricular innovations. So if somebody was looking to do something different, there were materials out there, where there was uh, research that they could turn to. So we kind of build it as like our best case scenario. Like, Whatever is happening in this class, we've removed as many barriers as possible and provided as many contextual supports as possible. Um, so yeah, I would expect that would be very different than the one in 2000 level classes where we're predominantly serving engineering majors at, at the larger R1 institutions. Um, but really, the amount of time spent lecturing wasn't that different, right? If you remove all of those constraints and you give all of these kind of affordances or, or supports, it's not like all of a sudden active learning has erupted in these classes. Um, so I think it, it gets deeper to the culture of mathematics, to the culture of your department and what's expected there. Please join me in thanking Dr. Estrella Johnson one more time.